Some say there has never been a chess player as great as Bobby Fischer. A leading Russian opponent described him as an Achilles without an Achilles heel. Fischer was not only known for being a chess genius, but also for spiraling into insanity. This video will take you through his highs and his lows. Bobby Fischer was born in Chicago on March 9, 1943, and raised in Brooklyn by a single mother from Switzerland born to Jewish parents. They were poor. Regina Fischer didn't even have the money to patch up Bobby's torn shoes when he was a kid. Regina was divorced from Hans Gerhard Fischer, a German biophysicist, but Bobby's actual father was most likely the result of an affair with her friend Paul Nemeny, a Hungarian Jewish physicist. When Bobby was six, his sister Joanne bought him a chess set and taught him to play. He felt chess was more exciting than Monopoly because no luck was involved and he found it far more challenging. His sister soon grew tired of the game and his mother was busy working as a teacher and a nurse, so Bobby spent several hours every day playing against himself. He loved the thousands of possible moves and the complex strategy involved. After a year of this, his mother took him to the Brooklyn Chess Club where he got lessons a couple of times a week with one of the club's best players, Carmen Nigro. Nigro charged him a dollar an hour, but Bobby believes he wasn't in it for the money, but simply to make sure he took the lessons seriously. And apparently he did. He was utterly obsessed with chess. One might even say it was his best friend. Actually, Fisher didn't have any real friends growing up. He thought having friends was only important for kids who had secrets and wanted someone to share them with. He had no secrets, so apparently he didn't feel the need to have friends. Fisher would spend Sundays playing chess with Nigro in Manhattan's Washington Square Park. He began spending less time with Nigro when he started being tutored by Jack Collins, a master player who once ranked as high as number 17 in the US. Collins spent his life in a wheelchair. He didn't quite fit in, just like Fisher. He was careful not to say he was Fisher's coach. That would be like saying someone had to coach Beethoven, Shakespeare, or Leonardo da Vinci. He thought Fisher was a genius on the level of those geniuses. Collins did have an extensive library collection of chess books, which Fisher devoured, spending five to 10 hours a day reading and studying. He would need the preparation when he faced older and more experienced opponents. When Fisher was 13 years old, he faced 26-year-old Donald Byrne, one of the top 10 players in America. Fisher played in black, Byrne in white. The game of the century, as it's remembered, took place in New York City on October 17, 1956. Fisher's moves looked like lethal art. He even dared to sacrifice his queen. Fisher got a thrill out of breaking his opponent's ego. His opponent was outclassed and outmatched. This game put Fisher on the map. The world knew it had a genius on its hands. The following year, when he was still only 14 years old, he won the US championship. A year later, he became the youngest ever grandmaster. And in 1972, he captured the world championship from the Soviet Union's Boris Spassky. This was stunning. The Soviets lived and breathed chess. They were more obsessed than Canadians are about hockey or the Chinese about table tennis. Then comes along a lone wolf from America who was up against the entire Soviet chess institution. It was a David versus Goliath matchup. Bobby Fischer single-handedly beat the Soviets at their own game. This took place during the Cold War and the symbolism wasn't lost on anyone. The world's two superpowers battled it out on a chessboard. Except Fischer nearly skipped the match of the century. He refused to fly to Reykjavik, Iceland for the tournament unless he got more money, including a guarantee of a slice of the lucrative TV revenue. US Secretary of State Henry Kissinger had to insist he, quote, get his butt over to Iceland. He finally flew there after a British investment banker offered to double the money to 250,000. Fischer was still in a foul mood when he arrived. He played poorly during the first match and lost. He didn't even show up for the second match, complaining that the TV cameras distracted him, so he lost automatically. The tournament organizers conceded to his demands for the third match to be played without TV cameras in the room. From that point on, his playing got stronger. Fischer, the 29-year-old who dropped out of high school, would beat Spassky to become world champion, single-handedly dismantling the Soviet Union's 24-year hold on the game. He became a hero to millions of Americans and inspired new interest in the game of chess. Some chess clubs saw membership double during the Fisher frenzy. He was a star and made the rounds of American TV. On the Carson Tonight Show, he showed off his brilliance by solving a sliding puzzle in 17 seconds. Uh, this was not very well mixed up. I want to say that it wasn't well mixed up. Yeah. 
Oh. 17. No. Well, they didn't mix it up too well. It takes about 30 seconds. <laughs> He reportedly had an IQ of 181, which is said to be even higher than Albert Einstein's. Although he scaled the heights of fame, Fisher wasn't all that likable. He had a habit of saying controversial things, though people tended to ignore it because he was the Cold War chess hero, after all. This is what he once said about female chess players in an interview with the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. The, the women are really very good players. I, mean, I guess I could give every one of them a knight and still win easily. Why, why is this? Do women make bad chess players? Oh, they're terrible chess players. I mean, some are better than others, you know, but... Uh, why they may not so? play in men's tournaments. I don't know why. I guess they're just not so smart. <laughs> Would you call yourself a misogynist? Excuse me, uh, what's the definition of that word? A woman hater? <laughs> no. No? no. What do you think of women? When it comes to chess, uh, not too much. He managed to offend everyone. During an interview with a Philippine radio station hours after 9-11, he said the attacks were, quote, wonderful news. I applaud the act. The U.S. and Israel have been slaughtering the Palestinians, just slaughtering them for years. I want to see the U.S. wiped out. He never hid his hatred of Jews, repeatedly making anti-Semitic remarks, despite being Jewish ethnically. His anti-American, anti-Semitic comments coincided with his growing paranoia. He decided the U.S. government was out to get him. He also believed the Israeli National Intelligence Agency, the Mossad, was after him. He refused to defend his world championship title in 1975. He complained that opponents were trying to poison his food, his hotel rooms were bugged, he feared the Russians wanted to bomb his plane. For years, Fisher carried a blue cardboard box with him wherever he went and refused to say what was inside. Once, when he went to use the restaurant restroom, he left it on the table and a friend he was with peeked inside. He saw a Bible. Religion appealed to his desire for logic and order. Except he later cut ties with the Worldwide Church of God, funded by a televangelist, after complaining that Herbert Armstrong's teachings made members lose their minds and become zombies. One of the sure signs of his mental decline was that he insisted on removing his dental fillings. He explained that he didn't want anything artificial in him and had heard of a guy wounded in World War II who had a metal plate in his head that picked up vibrations and even radio transmissions. His mental instability manifested in his physical appearance. Gone was the athletic young man who swam and played tennis to keep in shape for chess, which requires enormous mental and physical endurance. He was now unrecognizable. California police officers mistakenly arrested him because he resembled a man wanted for robbery. He spent 48 hours in jail and wrote a book about the alleged torture he endured. During his descent into madness, Bobby Fischer didn't play a single competitive game of chess in public for 20 years. But eventually he had to because he had run out of money. In 1992, he agreed to a $5 million rematch against his Russian arch rival, Spassky, in Yugoslavia. However, the US government wasn't too pleased about that. It defied UN sanctions against the war-torn country Americans were forbidden from doing any business in Yugoslavia. Fisher was warned he'd face 10 years in prison if he went ahead with his plans, but he didn't care. He won the tournament. Some believe he was coaxed into playing by his teenage Hungarian girlfriend, Zita Rajcini, who was also a chess player. She had apparently turned a pen pal relationship into a romance, despite their 30 year age gap. Although Fisher claimed he didn't have time for women, he is said to have married a Japanese chess player, Miyoko Watai, and lived with her in Japan for a few years. He reportedly hoped that as the spouse of a Japanese citizen, he could stay there as he had been on the run from American authorities for defying sanctions. But his attempt to stay in Japan was unsuccessful. Authorities arrested him for using a passport that had been revoked by the US government. He begged Iceland to take him in, the country that made him famous in 1972. Iceland welcomed him by making him a citizen. He would spend the rest of his days there living in obscurity. So what caused Bobby Fischer to descend into madness? Some speculate that training in blindfold chess can cause mental strain, as you can't see or touch the pieces, so you're forced to maintain a mental image in your head. However, there were signs something was not right with Bobby Fischer much earlier on. Legendary chess grandmaster Mikhail Tal picked up on it back in the 50s, mocking Fischer for being cuckoo. Another chess grandmaster, Paul Benko, once remarked, I'm not a psychiatrist, but it was obvious he was not normal. I told him, you are paranoid, and he said that paranoids can be right. World-renowned chess grandmaster and psychoanalyst Dr. Ruben Fine 
described in his book on Fisher that Fisher's mother had consulted him because she was concerned her teenage son was too obsessed with chess and felt he needed friends and other hobbies. Fine described how when he, quote, started a conversation with Fisher at one point about what he was doing in school. As soon as school was mentioned, he became furious, screamed, you have tricked me, and promptly walked out. For years afterward, whenever I met him in clubs or tournaments, he gave me angry looks, as though I had done him some immeasurable harm by trying to get a little closer to him. In other words, Fisher reacted in a paranoid way. Perhaps school was a sensitive spot. He dropped out at the age of 16 to focus on chess. He was always insecure about his lack of education and decided to trade his casual wear for suits when playing chess in order to look more sophisticated. Social skills were not his forte. When CBS's 60 Minutes spent his 29th birthday with him and surprised him with a cake, he actually refused it. Happy birthday to you. You were worrying about this? Why were you worrying about it? You know, I just don't go. First of all, I don't eat uh, this kind of cake. Second of all, I, I don't go for this. You know. All right. Yeah. Shall we take it away, please? Yeah. All right. It appears paranoia ran in his family. The FBI described Fisher's mother, Regina, as mentally unstable in their secret files on her. They had spied on her since the dawn of the Cold War in the 1940s. The FBI suspected that the left-leaning political activist was a communist spy. Both she and her then-husband had lived in Russia. The agency was also worried that the Russians had tried to recruit Bobby. Bobby's relationship with his mother was strained. He resented her for abandoning him when he was a teen so she could focus on her medical career. Although they hardly saw each other over the years, he is said to have become distraught after she passed away in 1997, quickly followed by his sister the following year. Some believe their deaths caused him to lose whatever last grasp he had on reality. Bobby's probable father was also believed to be paranoid. Paul Nemeny was highly intelligent. He even collaborated with Einstein's son, Hans Albert Einstein, who was also a scientist. Nemeny emigrated from Hungary to the US in 1939, but had trouble adjusting. He reportedly walked around with soap in his pockets, paranoid about getting his hands dirty. Some speculate Bobby Fischer could have had schizophrenia or Asperger's, though there was no evidence that he was diagnosed with any mental health disorders. It also does not appear that Fisher had any long-term treatment for mental health issues. One could only wonder if his life would have turned out differently if he did. During the last years of his life, he stayed in close touch with a psychiatrist who headed Iceland's hospital for the criminally insane. Dr. Magnus Skalassen stayed in hospital with Fisher as he lay dying of kidney failure. Fisher passed away on January 17, 2008. And according to Skalassen, his final words were, nothing is as healing as the human touch. Coming from a man who shied away from social contact, this was a remarkable thing to hear. It was fitting that having fallen in love with 64 black and white squares on a chessboard, Bobby Fischer died when he was 64 years old. He asked to be buried as a Catholic. Bobby Fischer once wrote an article for the Boy Scouts magazine, quote, with talent, study, and a positive attitude, there is no limit to how far you can go. Yet he failed to live up to his own words. If Fisher had stayed in the game longer, perhaps we would have seen a matchup with Garry Kasparov, arguably the two greatest chess players of all time, though they were 20 years apart. But it would never come to pass. The person who finally defeated Bobby Fisher was sadly himself. Documentaries like these command a lot of my energy. I try to stay as energized and relaxed as possible, which is why I trust Magnesium Breakthrough by Bioptimizers. I have trouble sleeping, so I've been taking Magnesium Breakthrough since the start of this year. And ever since, my sleep has gotten a lot better. I hardly wake up during the middle of the night. And I've noticed also during my day, I just feel a lot better and more energized. Most magnesium supplements are synthetic or use preservatives. When you get all seven critical forms of magnesium, like you do with Magnesium Breakthrough, your body gets a serious upgrade so you can feel better throughout your day. To find out more, head to magnesiumbreakthrough.com slash newsthink to get a 10% discount. My custom link is in my description and pinned comment. And don't forget to use my promo code newsthink10 at checkout. Thanks for watching. For Newsthink, I'm Cindy Palm.